Welcome to the Indigo Podcast, an exploration of human flourishing at work and beyond. I'm Ben Barron of Indigo Anchor and Cleveland State University. And I'm Chris Everett of Indigo Anchor. For more information, please visit us at www.indigopodcast.com. So our topic for today is how to get shit done. <laughs> and yeah, this is uh, you know appropriate, I think, for us to think about here towards the beginning of the year. And uh, we just did an episode on you know new habits for the new year. So maybe we could just dig into some of this about how you can actually get stuff done. And in the podcast today, we're going to talk about a few things. One, we're going to talk about queuing theory and why you need what we call a backlog. We're going to talk about how the idea of sandbagging is total bull. And then we're going to talk about this idea of the definition of done, managing nexus, and the broader organizational implications of all this stuff. What do you awesome. think, Chris? I, yeah. You know, like a good chunk of any consultant's work, uh, at least in the space that we deal in, is getting uh, stuff done. You know? Sure. You know, execs are at the top going like, gosh, darn it. Why why can't anything happen around here? <laughs> I, you know, our friend Mike Richardson calls it uh, a wheel, wheel spin, spin. Yeah. right? And just nothing, nothing happens. So, right, right. And organizations and leaders spend all this time and effort going through the process of developing some sort of strategy. They, you know, spend a few days working on this intensely and they have this great plan for how they're going to go attack something. And then just the execution just falls off and nothing actually happens. And it's just a shame. And it's a frustration that organizations and people, I think, everywhere really have. So, yeah, it's always a uh, strategy, you know, to kind of harken back to uh, some of that stuff, you know, oh, we've got strategy. And now we got results that that middle part is the getting shit done and and there's a lot lot of other stuff that goes there but it, it's a main point so right ben backlog what yeah. is a backlog so yeah so a backlog is simply a collection of all the things that you need to get done uh, this <laughs> is where <laughs> i mean it sounds really basic but the idea is that you spend some time either on your own and or with a team depending on what you're working on and you come up with all of those different tasks that need to happen in order for you to, you know, achieve whatever you want to achieve, you know, wealth, prosperity, health, I don't know, whatever it is, you come <laughs> up with all those different things and uh, you, you make them visible. Yeah. You know, if you go online and Google backlog and click the images tab, you're likely going to come up with a bunch of pictures of post-it notes and there's backlogs and backlogs of backlogs and... <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, some of the data talks about teams of teams, you know, a lot of the army generals like to talk about, oh, yeah, I, I really focus on teams of teams. But really mm -hmm. what it is, is this giant list of stuff to get done. Right. And it, a lot of the thinking that comes around here is queuing theory, which is um, queuing theory is actually a branch of mathematical studies. Um uh, and models of the act of waiting in lines. And so when you think of you send an email to a coworker, hey, I, I need to get this piece of information from you, or I need you to do this task on this project, you know, congratulations, your task is now in that person's queue. Mm -hmm. And hopefully they get to it that day or what, whenever, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of probably my favorite case study for queuing theory um out in the practical world is like walt disney uh, yeah you know those yeah. guys have got dialed in you know you're gonna wait four hours to get on a roller coaster it disney probably has it the most pleasurable right right yeah and i've spent my fair share of time in in lines at disney world with uh with fighting screaming children around me. So <laughs> I, 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 I'm starting to have some uh, flashbacks right now, as you mentioned this. <laughs> so, so you could actually do a whole episode on queuing theory. I mean, right. it touches a bunch of manufacturing uh, stuff, uh, the lean movement type stuff, um, theory of constraints, you know, which are where, the, where there's bottlenecks and all of that kind of stuff 
kind of touches on or is within um, queuing theory. So it's waiting in line. So one of the main uh, rubs, right? So you get a backlog, let's say, and all right, here's a hundred items. Now everybody go work on them at once. <laughs> well, well, that doesn't work. So a, a backlog actually needs to be groomed. Mm -hmm. um, what, what do you mean by what do you mean by grooming it? So you got to have a priority. Like if we only did one thing, what would that be? Mm -hmm. Well, let's just put that one at the top. And then if we did two things, what's that going to be? Well, then that's the, that's the second one. So I've, I've been in organizations where you come in and the CIO tells me, oh, we've got a five-year, seven-year backlog. And you're like, uh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, well, right. what are you delivering this month or this quarter or heck, even this year, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, well, well, we're very busy. Well, I, I know, but what, what are you delivering this quarter or a year? Uh, we've got a lot of people working on things. We've got a seven-year backlog in it. Oh, man. <laughs> that, that is not the place you want to be in. And it's actually, um, it just it's not a mature execution. So, right. you know, one of the ways to think about this is... Let's say you can do a hundred units of work in a moment of time or a block of time. Well, you could either get one unit of work done on a hundred tasks, meaning it takes you a hundred years to get anything delivered, or you could maybe complete three tasks in, you know, totally complete within that year. And so when you have a backlog, it makes you do those those trade-offs and drug deals on, on what are you going to actually get done? Are right. we going to just start a hundred things and get nothing done? I wouldn't want to be in that kind of organization. Strategically, it's going to be hard for you to reach your goals. Yeah. And it's all, I think the idea here is that when, when everything is a priority, then really nothing's a priority. Uh, and w when you're talking there about, you know, what you're working on and how many things you choose to work on, I was reminded of a talk that I once attended. It was at a, an HR conference, uh, some years ago. And John Maxwell was the keynote speaker. He's uh, pretty well known, uh, you know, he's written a lot of kind of popular leadership books and stuff. And he had, he had a number of insightful things he said, but the way he put it, kind of what you just said, he, he talked about, you know, if you got, Let's imagine you got a bunch of trees in your backyard. You want to cut them down. Uh, you know, you could go out there and you could take one swipe with your axe at each tree every day. Like go from one tree, hit it, go to the next <laughs> one, hit that one. Right. You, could, you could go around and do that. And it would take you forever to accomplish anything. He said, you know, or you could go out there and you could say, well, I'm going to start with this one and I'm going to just keep on whacking at this thing until it, it falls over. Right. And I think that's a little bit about what you're talking about here. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So so the only way you can do that is if you have a list of all the tasks mm -hmm. um, and they can be decomposed like really small or really big, depending on which level of the organization, what kind of problem you're trying to solve. And then they need to be prioritized. Um, super, super uh, important because the idea there's this idea of efficiency versus effectiveness. Mm -hmm. So like when that, when that CIO is telling me, well, uh, people are very busy here. I'm sure that those people are very efficient. Um, well, maybe not with that kind of management, but <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I'm, I'm sure most people are, get really good at what they got to do. They optimize that kind of thing. But what we don't know is if they're working on the right thing. Mm -hmm. And so, right. like you said, you could have, Somebody could be so efficient at taking one whack at each of those trees. They have the best axe technique or, you know, they've got their their burly man outfit on or whatever. They're wearing their flannel plaid, right? And they, they, look, <laughs> they look like a lumberjack and they've got everything perfect. And they're just, you know, they're hitting each one right. perfectly. But they're not being super effective because it's going to take how many months for them to actually have cleared that backyard. Right. And, and I think, you know, I come across managers all the time who are and senior executives who are in this just kind of put out the fires mode. Right. So they're just ugh. moving from one task to another, uh, not really getting anything done, but just kind of taking that one swipe at each tree. 
and they don't really have a rhyme or reason for what's more important, what's less important. And they're, you know, not being effective because they're not producing results really on anything. They're just kind of maintaining the status quo by putting out fires. So if you're a senior executive and you get a backlog for your organization and OKRs are kind of one way of thinking about a backlog, some of the stuff from the agile um, methodologies, they'll have some stuff on backlogs. But, you know, nobody really owns this idea. It's this idea of queuing up the task that needs to be done grooming them or prioritizing them. And this helps pass ownership for what the organization delivers up and down, Mm -hmm. right? So if you're at the top, if you're, if you're in the C-suite and you have like, Hey, these are the critical items or here's where the backlog is. And here's the number one, most important thing. Number two, most important thing. And then you send it back in the organization down in the organization and said, wow, Based on the size of number one, that's all we can do this year. Mm-hmm. Like it's actually provides a platform or, or, you know, I forget who said it. it's like a bookmark for a conversation. When you can just mm. put something out there, it's a conversation that can then happen. Whereas before, if you hadn't communicated what you want to get done and how that's prioritized, people don't really know how to talk to you. Okay, CEO. Yeah, I. I see your stuff. I guess we'll just start working. And, Mm -hmm. and, and then they get into that efficiency thing. Look at how efficient and Hey, somebody will probably come up with a dashboard on an overpriced software platform for you to see red lights and green lights and project (laughs) statuses. Right. But actually, right. You haven't had something to where um, the organization can tell you, Hey, we can't do these things. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, and you know, another thing that I think is really great about this process of going through the creation of a backlog, because, you know, you and I have done this with organizations before and having that conversation, I think, among key leaders in the organization is very enlightening to them. And it, it allows for there to be then be some shared consensus and shared understanding about, hey, this is what is important for us. And this is what we're going to do over the next, you know, whatever period of time. Uh, so they have that focus and that, that shared, you know, pulling in the same direction, so to speak, uh, versus just kind of moving from one thing to another. You know, a lot of, a lot of people in organizations, and, you know, I've been one of them at various points in my career, but they, they've mastered the art of looking busy. Oh. <laughs> they, you know, and, and sometimes it's like a career survival thing. It's like, hey, I'm not getting any direction from anybody. I want to make sure that people are, uh, you know, recognizing that I'm trying. So I'm just going to, you know, kind of look busy. I'm going to work hard on these different things. I don't really care if it's actually moving the organization forward or not. And, you know, that may be a career or a, you know, specific like survival strategy for you in a, in a jacked up organization, but good organizations are ones in which there is clarity around what's important, what's not, and how we're going to move the ball forward. Right, Ben. So let, let me bring up another item here. So we talk about, okay, you're at the C-suite, you have that, you provide that platform for the organization pushback. We've both been in organizations and the military and stuff. So you never have all the resources you need to do everything. Right. So if I, if I come to you, Ben, and we're in Afghanistan or something, I say, I need you to do one, two, three, A, B, C, and you can only mm-hmm. do one, two, three. What, what's a conversation look like from you back to me? Well, I think you have to be very honest in that situation. And you have to say, well, sir or ma'am, if we're, if we're staying with the military situation, uh-huh. uh, you know, th- these, are the, these are the things that I have the resources to do. Here's based upon what I know, here's what I think is probably the most important for us to focus upon. I don't think we can do X, Y, or Z. Uh, what do you think? How can we work together to prioritize this? That's what I would do in that situation. Right. And you can't just make up stuff about like, oh, well, okay, you know, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. We'll get it all done. You know, that because then it's just not going to happen. And then down the road, you're going to be having to kind of play catch up. It's just not going to work. Right. Yeah. And I see this with director level people, senior managers. They start to, you know, pick up some budgetary responsibility, have more than just a couple people under them. Mm -hmm. And if you don't push back and say no, it, it is a beacon to a mature uh, senior executive 
that you're not ready for more responsibility because they need appropriate pushback. So, so mm-hmm. when somebody says, if you're a junior manager, if you're somebody lower down in the org, hey, we need to do these 12 things and you know you can only do two, well, then that's a time where you build maybe a PowerPoint deck or like build up some evidence around it. It's like, hey, listen, I hear these 12 things and you need to pick two that are the most important. Or if you've done the good job creating a backlog, they already know which ones. Like, hey, going down these 12 things on the backlog, we can only do two and here's why. Um, lack of budget. Oh, well, then the C-suite person or a senior executive can say, great, how much extra budget do you need? Because we got to get all 12 done. And Mm -hmm. you can have that facilitation of a conversation with the organization on how to allocate resources. Um, Somebody that's senior that has the ability to move around resources can't know how to most efficiently do that if the people below them don't actually help them understand what those and those resources can be. Um, tools or processes or budget or more headcount or, you know, the default is generally, uh, just give me 12 more people. Well, that's not always the need there. So you got to be, when you get something that's a too big of an ask, you got to have something mature to bring back and push back and be like, hey, we'll do whatever you need. If you want us to do that much, this is the extra stuff it's going to require. Right, right. So there has to be some candor in that conversation. Uh, you know, it takes some um, some intestinal fortitude sometimes as a as a uh, say the director or the whoever that you know to to push push that information back up, saying no, we can't do that. And I think in some ways, in some organizations, it can kind of go against your natural tendency to want to please the boss. You know, because you don't it, you know that's in a way you know bringing some bad news uh, up the chain. Uh, but good organizations are ones that welcome that and say, "Hey, look, if if this is if this is not going to work, I need you to tell me that it's not going to work." And that's something that we look for when we go into organizations and we're assessing their executives' maturity. Um, a question that we often ask is, you know, tell us about a time you had to push back on something. How often yeah. do you push back? And you know, if there's conversations like you know, oh, this is our quarterly planning meeting or whatever, however people do planning or execution, um, and this is the moment of the meeting where everybody gets to push back. Well, that's a healthy sign. Mm-hmm. So yes, it is. So, so Ben, I get my backlog and I look at it and I say, "Ooh, I could do six, but I don't want to get." I don't want to get beat if somehow something at the end of the year doesn't get six. So I'm just going to tell them I I can do three and I'm going to make a really, (laughs) really awesome, beautiful PowerPoint with a bunch of numbers that they probably won't review anyway and show how I can only do three. Yeah, that's the that's the sandbagging approach, right? (laughs) That's the saying, look, I'm going to kind of hold back here and, you know, set this easy goal so that I can be sure to make it and not run the risk of potentially uh, not fulfilling all of these things or whatever. And, you know, that's in a healthy organization. That is just garbage. You, you can't garbage. have garbage. garbage. You, yeah. You can't have an organization uh, that has, you know, if you want your organization to be successful and really competitive, you don't, you can't have this culture where people feel like they have to, you know, uh, put speed limits on themselves. Right. And that's that's what we're doing when we tell the boss, okay, well, you know, we don't want to say that we're going to, you know, shoot for the moon here because pretty sure we're not going to be able to. And, you know, we need to just say we're going to do these three things. Um, No, that's I mean, that's that's definitely it's very, very common to see that, Um, you know, but it's not not what best organizations do. Yeah. And and think about the budgeting process that goes on in organizations. So, you know, upper manager to lower manager, you know, hey, I want the most amount of work for the least amount of money. And then the lower <laughs> manager, <laughs> right? I mean, that's kind yeah. of what it is. It's like, hey, you know, I, what's, what's the most work I can get out of your team for the least cost? And then the guy below that is like, what's the least amount of effort? I can get <laughs> for the most amount yeah. of money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I want to, I want to just work hard enough not to get fired. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and the problem with that is both people aren't aligned at 
looking at what's best for the company, right? Mm -hmm. And I know that sounds, that's a, you know, campy office space movie line, you know, (laughs) ask yourself. Is this, yeah, is this good for the company? (laughs) (laughs) And all you need is, you just need that banner, you know, ask yourself. Yeah. Well, and and ha- so the question is, right, if sandbagging's garbage and campy questions like that that motivate nobody, you know, is this right. good for the company? Like how do you do this in a way that's not corny that mm-hmm. drives real results and um gets you where you need to go? And and culture's got to be addressed here. Right. And because this is something that is part of culture, and organizational culture, as we've talked about in a prior podcast, and you know, I've mentioned in you know various podcasts that we've done now, uh, you know, culture is all about those deep norms and values and stories and ways of thinking that have become embedded and taken for granted within the organization. And because it's this very powerful yet deep thing within the organization, it's difficult to change. Uh, and so, you know, my first reaction is, how do organizations, you know, do this? Well, it's not easy. Um, but I, I, I come back to, uh, you know, the idea that this really is on the tone and the approach that leaders take uh, when they are communicating with their people. Um, you know, it's kind of that tone at the top that 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 the organization is setting about right. how we're going to get things done, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. Uh, how, you know, what are good goals and how do we work towards them? Uh, how do we pull together and do things? How do we communicate when something is going off the rails? Uh, all of that stuff is all about leadership. You know, if, if, if as a, you know, we talked earlier about, you know, if you have a leader who comes to a subordinate and says, Hey, this is, you know, I, I need you to do these 10 things. And let's say the, uh, the subordinate has the chutzpah to then say, well, no, we can only do three, um, but we could do the all 10 if we had these kinds of resources. If that leader then turns to that subordinate and just, you know, gives them the tongue lashing or, you know, says that's totally unacceptable or, you know, treats them poorly in that situation, so to speak, uh, then you're starting to create or you're you're wrecking any kind of um candor that you're going to get from that person in the future. Uh, and you're really setting a tone that says, you know, that I don't actually care about your opinion. I just want, you know, to you to get stuff done. And a lot of times that that's what I see in a lot of organizations that are frustrated with, you know, how do we get stuff done? It, you know, they, they, they attempt to do it just through, you know, basically bullying people into doing it. They, they, they become more right. demanding in their communication. And that's really not, what needs to happen. So if no matter where you are in the organization, but especially if you're an entrepreneur founder or at the C-suite of the org, this is the stuff that should keep you up at night, right? Yeah. This, this is a bunch of potential energy within your organization that you're not capturing, that organizations with better culture and better alignment and better methodologies for creating backlogs and having these discussions are, they're going to trample you in the marketplace. Um, mm-hmm. In the past, back when we were all waterfall level project management, which can still be okay, right? What's waterfall? <laughs> so wa- waterfall is <laughs> a project management methodology where you do one thing at a time. So you'll have some yep. kind of project scope. Then you'll, you know, stakeholder roster. You'll have a kickoff meeting. And then you do step one, then step two. If you're really advanced, you might like, oh, we could do step one and two at the same time, but then three will go on. You know, that's where it kind of goes down big upfront requirements and then delivery at the end. So Mm -hmm. we could do a whole episode on waterfall versus agile. Google that stuff. There's probably some simple explainer YouTube videos. It'll be helpful. But as these types of Um, methodologies of organizing and shaping organizations are socialized out of Silicon Valley. It's already happened. It's already all over the place. It hasn't hit all industries yet as much. Mm -hmm. But as they happen, that is a big, big gap that that a competitor that's got that dialed is going to beat you in the marketplace pretty bad. Right, right. And so the, the idea, going back here to this idea of sandbagging, you know, when you're kind of 
having these goals that are intentionally sub optimal or, you know, they're below what you really think is possible. Uh, you know, it's just to, to kind of provide some security in your own um, ability to get things done. You know, it, what you really need in order to get stuff done, you need that backlog. And you also need to realize the sandbagging is garbage uh, and have a culture that really supports stretching and really trying to do something that is uh, that is difficult. Um, you know, and th this kind of goes to this idea that there's just a, a general problem in many organizations of too much aversion to taking risks. Uh, and, you know, you don't want everybody in the company doing something that is going to put the entire organization into financial jeopardy every day. Uh, but you do want people to feel like they can take smart, uh, you know, relatively, um, uh, you know, uh, good risks that can help move the organization forward. Um, and that's, you know, a risk could be even something as simple as disagreeing with the group. Right. You right. Know? And this, this is why, or this is why I say people should stay up at night around this. So what you generally see, and when we come in to do executive coaching, or we do these like organizational turnarounds and stuff like that, is you'll see a manager. Well, we've seen all kinds of weird complaints. What was one we saw? Well, th this plant manager isn't charismatic enough. Yeah. Um, or we'll see people, this team is just garbage. There's a culture of laziness there. And mm -hmm. I most people don't realize that it doesn't happen unilaterally. These stuff co these cultural problems evolve, uh, you know, all sides contribute to them, right? Yes. But the, the people that have the power to start implementing changes are the people in structural authority within that organization. However, this is where they get frustrated and, and, you know, we see yelling and cussing and I've seen a guy throw a chair against the wall once. <laughs> uh, I know. Well, they see the problem, but they don't know how to solve it, right? Yeah. They they don't have those tools. And so if you're uh, in HR or corporate training, you know, giving your managers the tools. And if you're at the C-suite of a you know small startup or entrepreneur founder, mid-size organization, you have to, what training are you providing these managers to curate the culture within the organization? Which is so when we talk about the culture needs to support stretching, do your mm -hmm. do your managers all the way up and down the line know how to curate that culture without you know making it to where there's no discipline and execution? Right, right. right? Uh, do they know how to curate um, a a disciplined risk culture? So when we say there's a general problem of too much risk aversion, mm -hmm. um, well, we don't want to just dive into the risk pool willy nilly. Uh, so do your, do your managers know how to do that? And mm -hmm. then, and then Ben, I want you to talk about, so Amy Edmondson's work on psychological safety. I, I just love that term psychological safety. Right. So uh, Amy Edmondson's a researcher <laughs> who has done a lot of work and kind of introduced this whole idea of psychological safety. And the idea that, behind this is that in teams with other people that were working with, uh, we have, there's variance in the degree to which we can take, we feel like we can take risks, you know, interpersonally in that context, you know, in some teams, in some organizations, uh, you know, you may feel like very hesitant to disagree with the group. Uh, you may feel like you just kind of need to go along with what everyone else is saying. And I see this a lot, you know, especially in groups that are just forming, Right. Um, but the idea of having a very psychologically safe team is that people feel like they can take those interpersonal risks. Uh, they feel like they can, even if nine people in the team, imagine a team of 10 people, nine of them are, are saying one thing, you know, someone can have the uh, ability and the willingness and maybe even feel the obligation if they feel differently to say something about that and say, well, you know, I think differently and this is why. Um, and this is extremely important in terms of uh, trying to maintain a high level of reliability in a team for, you know, if someone is noticing that something's going wrong, right? Imagine a surgical team, you know? Right. Um, I was, so I was talking actually about psychological safety in my MBA class that I teach at Cleveland State University. And 
uh, you know, I, one of the students in my class, he's, he's an anesthesiologist and, um, you know, I was talking about psychological safety and talking about interpersonal risks and so forth. And, and he said, uh, he kind of piped up and he said, oh yeah, by the way, if you don't do this, if you don't have this in a team, people die. Right. I was like, oh, well, thank you very much for that endorsement and making people, making people wake up and listen a little bit even more. That's, That's an emotionally light yeah. statement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and it's true because you want someone who can, who can say like, Hey, like I just did this wrong thing. Um, you know, or Hey, you know, doc or Hey nurse, uh, is that really what we need to be doing here? You know, um, I was talking with, uh, with somebody else in the medical world who is, you know, um, you know, mentioning how someone recently uh, put a nerve block in on the wrong side of the body, right? So they're doing an operation on the left and this happened on the right. And, uh, you know, this person, you know, you got, you better speak up, right? Because if you don't, then that person is, you know, going to be in, in a world of hurt. Um, and it's a very serious thing, but you got to have the ability. Um, people need to feel like they can do that. And this, again, comes back to leadership and culture. Um, you know, one one big thing that I, I talk about with leaders on this one is, uh, you know, when someone does this, when someone exhibits this, I you know, taking an interpersonal risk by disagreeing, by um, pushing back on an idea, uh, by, you know, suggesting that, you know, a different course of action is more appropriate, uh, your reaction to that person is absolutely critical. Because if you come back and, you know, dismiss them, immediately, you know, maybe, maybe they're totally wrong, but if you come back and you dismiss them immediately, uh, or you say, you know, you just need to get on board with what we're doing here. That's irrelevant. You're going to quash that not only for that person, but you're also sending a message to the rest of the team that, Hey, what we really value here is consensus and speed <laughs> over, right. Uh, qu over quality, <laughs> you know, high performing teams that I've been on are not necessarily just big and oftentimes they're very far from a group hug kumbaya session where we all just get along and, and have fun. We, you know, on a, a, a high performing team, you push each other and, you know, you, you put an idea out there and, you know, you can totally expect that someone's going to push back on it. And here's the thing, you welcome that, you know, it's not like you're afraid to put an idea out there. Uh, you know, you put an idea out there and somebody's going to say something about it, but you welcome that. You say, all right, you know, I'd love to hear what you say. Let's try to make this better. And that's, that's a mindset shift and a culture shift that the best teams, the best organizations really start to embrace. Right. And, and it's super important. This stuff does not come naturally. Gosh, the world would be an amazing place if it did. But most people learn their leadership skills from monkey see, monkey do. Um, a lot of managers don't want to say, hey, you know, I think there's a cultural problem here of risk aversion. And I don't know how to fix it because that's the last thing that, you know, Generally, directors, senior managers want to say, oh, look, there's this leadership need here that I don't have the skills to address, you know, there, and there's not an organizational culture where they can raise his hand, their hand and say, I need training on curating culture around risk aversion or mm -hmm. or these kinds of things. So, you know, it'd be outside the scope of this one episode, but managers need to have these skills and it's more than just how to generate a Excel report, right? Right. And, and this is so important coming back to, you know, idea, what we're talking about today is, you know, how to get stuff done. And if you have, so you have your backlog, but if no one's engaged in it and debating it and talking about it and reflecting upon how the work is being done and, you know, suggesting things that maybe aren't very popular, uh, you are not going to get things done very well. Everyone's going to pretend like the world is great. They're going to pretend like we're all making progress. And then nothing actually happens, right? Um, you know, so when you create a culture, for example, where people are punished either intentionally or unintentionally for taking those risks, they're going to start to become very cautious and they're not going to take those risks. So you need that backlog. You need people to feel safe to shoot for something that is bigger, right? Not, not just sandbagging their goals, um, having something that they can actually stretch for and maybe, you know, not achieve because it was either unrealistic or uh, they, they need to be able to shoot for the moon a little bit, right? Right. And, you know, we talk about this in our uh, performance review uh, episode where, you know, one way is divor divorcing outcomes from performance reviews. So whereas mm -hmm. a performance can review can address how we get stuff done, 
Um, the other items like OKRs, that's objectives and key results. Um, that's one methodology of, of tracking what we're going to do and how we're going. Because if, mm-hmm. if somebody does, you know, they say shoot for the moon, get the stars kind of thing. Um, which, right, the stars are further than the moon. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I just think about those things. But um, <clears throat> those kinds of organizations where people have that safety and can go are inspiring. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, the the whole, the, you know, the whole idea of shooting for the moon, like that phrase, you know, harkens back to when, uh, you know, our world and particularly, you know, you had the, uh, the United States and the Soviet Union in this race to really try to put somebody on the moon. And that it was, it, it it is inspiring. Yeah. I mean, the stuff, and then that, that just creates a positive cultural snowball mm-hmm. where everybody's like, man, I can't wait. This is, this is amazing. Right. So, right. so, so you've got a good backlog. You got a psychologically safe environment with good, good, um, cultural practices and everything. Let's talk about some of the ideas. Okay. What, what could cause us to derail in your mission to get stuff done? Mm-hmm. Right. So, you know, there are some kind of some other aspects of how you go about uh, dealing with all those things in your backlog that I think are really important. And one of those, uh, you know, has to do with this idea of the definition <clears throat> of done. Uh, so, Chris, why don't you explain for our listeners what this what is this? What is this idea of the definition of done? So you got an item on your backlog. Everybody's chewing on that backlog, getting stuff done, but. They don't know when to stop, right? Right. So, like, I think of just all kinds of places where it derails of, you know, okay, this design is done in engineering. Well, actually, it's, well, it may be done sitting on your computer, but it's not done until that design is done in engineering, approved and filed in the correct folder. So production Mm -hmm. can do something with it. Um, Or, oh, we're done. Well, has the manual been written for the new nimbus 2000 or you know whatever you're making <laughs> is that is that from harry potter <laughs> yeah i think so <laughs> it slips out sometimes <laughs> so so one of the things is is if you throw out with each item on your backlog if it has a clear definition of done and this you know definitely comes from agile and some of these other places mm-hmm then people can say, no, no, it's actually not done when it's that. It's done when Brenda or Jimmy in accounting um, gets the final budget requisition. or And you can miss those pieces that continually miss and places where you don't have a formalized process. Is it heals those kinds of items. And mm-hmm. you're like, okay, then, then it also socializes those processes broadly. So clear definition of done helps, helps us handle those handoffs um also think about and i mean maybe this is a bit controversial any of our engagements overseas you know people will have fights over what they mean and what happens but a lot of it is there's not a clear definition of done right right that's very true and so um, I believe what you're recommending here and suggesting is that for all those different items, you got your backlog, all your different things, you've groomed it. So you have <laughs> priorities, right? Uh, it has been groomed. Uh, so it's, it's prioritized. You have shared understanding on that. You have, uh, you know, a, a healthy team environment where people can really speak up about how things are going and so forth. Uh, but then you need to have some shared understanding about when something is done, what does success look like for this post-it note that has this item on it? Uh, and that's what a, a shared definition of done is really about, right? Right. And it it also helps you manage those handoffs. So if you look at any times where projects really run into rubs, um, it's, you know, if I have to do this task all on my own, I'm good to go. But if I got to rely on three other people, two of which exist outside the organization or maybe vendors or something like that, mm-hmm. I I need to have clear handoffs, right? And clear definition of done uh, help with that. And the other piece is, is just managing those handoffs. So anytime you have Nexus with something else, 
that's a place where you're going to have to put in time. That's also the place where you might have to have, ugh, and I hate these things, meetings, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's actually very important, especially in those situations where, you know, having that, um, you're taking a piece of work and you're passing it off to another another entity, um, you know, you've got to get aligned on what that what needs to happen and what what the what done looks like for both parties and so forth. Right. And anytime you have to work outside of a small team or like with vendors and stuff, having those regular meetings will help you monitor the progress and risk that you can't directly see within that team or, or unit of working folks. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, another thing that this is helpful for when you have a clear definition of done is it can be helpful uh, to, uh, because it allows you to uh, monitor your progress towards getting that item complete. You know, uh, in a recent episode, we talked about when you're trying to accomplish something, you know, some, reach some goal, uh, monitoring your progress along the way can definitely help you uh, increase the probability that you're actually going to attain that goal. And so uh, having a clear definition of done is very important for that. Um, you can tell, OK, you know, here's here's what done looks like for this, but here's where we are. I can have a good idea of how we're how we're moving along. Right. And. And that helps your culture as well, right? Mm -hmm. You start to get a culture of getting stuff done, which is is what you want. And if you've come about it in a way that's not, I just want more work for less money, right? And yeah. all those culture killing things that just make you hate your life if you have to go work at an organization that that has that kind of culture. Sure, sure. And, you know, we're talking about this a lot in terms of, you know, how executives and directors and organizations can do this. But even like all this stuff about how you get stuff done, it, I think it applies to your personal life. It applies to my family life, right? Like right behind, like where I'm sitting at this very moment behind me on the wall are a bunch of post-it notes that have to do with stuff that needs to get done around the house. And it was so funny because my, my wife the other day said, hey, we need to like uh, revisit the backlog. And so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because we were just talking about like, you know, what we want to things we want to get done and and so forth and then you know we then here's the thing you know you imagine you know she and i we're, we're running a little organization here where we have us you know it's a benevolent dictatorship but we're running this little <laughs> this little thing it's definitely not a democracy even though our kids try to make it one right um right you know so but we we, we have to have that alignment on what's important so that then we don't have disagreements about it because you can imagine you know when you don't have alignment there uh, around, you know, what done looks like or what's important to work on next, uh, that can create a lot of just interpersonal, um, you know, nonsense that's not helpful. And so it, it can be very helpful, you know, at the, the small, you know, the, the smaller levels of a, a individual, a family, a team, an organization. Uh, I think a lot of this has implications for how, how stuff gets done everywhere. And it frees up psychological bandwidth. Mm. Um, I know let's just keep going with the home theme. My wife, I mean, I would just live in a shipping container, you know, <laughs> <It takes. laughs> I, I remember I, I, I came back from Afghanistan and my wife and I checked in with the therapist just to make sure that, you know, getting back in line with the mm -hmm. children, getting back into the domestic flow of things. And, and my poor wife exasperatedly said, you know, he'd just be happy living in a shipping container. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, the therapist was like, oh, that's a bit of Tuesday. I was like, no, no, she's right, actually. Like, there is only, like, it takes two minutes to clean up a connex that you live in with one other person. Yep. Right? And and so, anyway, back to the backlog kind of idea. So, my wife is so good at everything home. I, I'm so lucky to have her. Um she has a list of everything. And especially since I travel around the country consulting, um, she helps, she knows when all the kids school events are and all of yeah. those kinds of things, but it can get really overwhelming if we don't have a system for kind of managing that. So mm -hmm. if we come flying into the weekend after a week of kids at school, me being gone, you know, I'm home. Okay. I got to like do laundry, dry cleaning, repack my clothes, all that kind of stuff. Kids have got, sporting events or, or, or what all the stuff that happens. And then we've got a list of stuff. I mean, everybody has stuff in their house or apartment that's just like, you know, I need to dust that lamp. 
mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. I, there's that hole in the wall I need to patch or, you know, you have all of these things and you can just always feel like you're drowning and never catch it, catching right. up. Right. But if you have a backlog, you can be realistic and say, hey, we're just going to do a small sprint this weekend of three items. Mm-hmm. And and we're going to take a much needed psychological break for ourselves. And once you've committed and limited the scope of what you're going to do, you don't have to worry about those thousand items. However, right. if you're wired like somebody who wants everything to get done and not get missed, you still have that. Well, well what about all these things? Well, a backlog helps you capture those. So you can say, oh, yeah, I need to patch that part of the drywall. Pop that on a post-it load, put it on your backlog. And it's a way of releasing yourself psychologically from just the tyranny of that never ending to do list. Mm -hmm. So, so like when I sit down with my kids after being gone on a trip, you know, they'll crawl up in your lap, they'll give you a hug and it's so great. I want to be fully present in those moments. I don't want to be thinking, Oh, this is great, but I need to get that email to George. I need Mm -hmm. to, you know, if you have all of those items captured on a backlog, it frees you up to be present in the moment and it'll also help you have the psychological bandwidth to get done on those critical tasks that you are deciding to do in the near term. That's right. And you know, another thing it does too, um, either at home or work or anywhere, is it allows you as an individual or a team to know what they can work on next if, for example, they get something done faster than they thought they would. You know, it's like, hey, well, we got this done. I don't have to go ask the boss what's next. It's in the backlog. (laughs) Yeah, right. It's right there. And, you know, so then you're not just sitting around kind of twiddling your thumbs thinking, okay, well, what do I need to do here? Uh, Now, this does require some time, requires some planning. You got to actually come up with that list of all those things that you want to do, your backlog. You need to uh, have it prioritized, which is, you know, oftentimes can be a a really interesting conversation, Uh, but it can be very, very helpful to actually getting things done. Awesome. Yeah. So so Ben, today in the podcast, just to do a recap here. So queuing theory uh, is something we talked about today. You know, you guys need a damn backlog. Get one. (laughs) I mean, you can look at different ways. There's thousands of vendors that'll sell you software (laughs) that does what Post-it Notes do. It's fine. Whatever you want to use, you just need one, right? Right. Um, second thing we talked about is sandbagging is bull. Right. Um, and that should keep you up at night because probably you as a senior manager are curating a culture that makes that happen. Yeah. Um, or your junior managers are. And so you need to have a way to look at that cultural elements of psychological safety and what making a culture of getting stuff done. Right. And then once you've done all that, and we also talked about stuff, the definition of done, you got to have clear definitions of done for the things that you're going to do. You need to manage nexus, um, those things that are next to you and those handoffs with the appropriately calibrated cadence of meetings. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, with all that being said, I think I I need to go work on my backlog. (laughs) Awesome, Ben. Thanks for listening to the Indigo Podcast. If you like this podcast, please consider helping us by rating us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen, telling your friends about us, having us on your podcast, or mentioning us on social media. Our website is www.indigopodcast.com, where you can access more information about us and this episode. Thanks again, and we look forward to talking with you again soon.